Christian Horner, OBE, thanks for being with us. Great, great to see you. A uh, long time since we shared a Formula One paddock. Um, but I saw even then the high performance approach that you take to life. So could you explain to us what high performance represents to you? Well, high performance is everything that we do. Obviously, ultimately, it is the car. But, you know, generating and, and focusing your performance into all aspects that contribute that is is everything that we're we're about so it's getting the most out of people being the best that you can be focusing on your you know understanding where your weaknesses are understanding where your strengths are um and uh, yeah it just encompasses all aspects you know of, of of competition and and life in many respects so where do you focus more than in this team do you focus more on your strengths or do you focus more on your weaknesses i suppose we um you know, you have to focus on your weaknesses because I think that by understanding where your weaknesses are, it only adds to your strengths. And I think even with a race that you win, there's things that you can do better. There's always something that you can improve. You're always learning. Life is a journey at the end of the day. And and, and a motor race is a two-hour snapshot of that. And there's always something that you can learn, that you can improve, that you can do, you can do better. And then you carry that knowledge, that, that know-how, you know, into the, into the future events. So can I take you, like that phrase you use there, Christian, that life is a journey. Can I take you back to the journey that you went on before sure. you joined Formula One? Because reading your biography was really fascinating. You seem to throw yourself into a, a, a moving towards a goal and then work out how to get there yeah. uh, along the way. So you had almost that, that burn the boats attitude of, you know, I'll commit to something and then I'll find out a way of doing it, whether it was yeah. you going into Formula 3000 or being yeah. a driver yourself. Yeah. Would you tell us a little bit more about that approach to life? Well, I, I started, you know, my uh, my journey, as it were, with a the, with the desire to be a racing driver. I was always fascinated by speed, you know, speed and, and, and whether that was making a go-kart to go down the hill at the back of the house, um, whether it was one of those evil Knievel, um, you know, wind-up toys that, that you build a ramp and see how far he could jump. Um, it was, you know, how many how many bricks could you build a ramp and how far could you jump on your own BMX? Um, so speed was always something that I was I was fascinated by. Then I discovered the world of of, of kart racing, go kart racing, and and it was my mum's fault because um, I plagued and plagued and plagued, uh, you know, my father um, to get a motorized go kart that was to drive around the garden. And uh, I think he'd had a bit of enough of me going on and on about it. And it was it was my twelfth birthday was coming up, and they, they, there was a local newspaper in in Leamington Spa, and my mum found in one of the adverts at the back of it an an old go kart that was for sale. It was about forty quid or something, right. and um, and she bought it for me for my birthday. And it, it turned out that this this cart was a, an actual racing cart. So when we put it on the ground with the idea of driving it on the grass, you know, your bum was on the floor. So, so suddenly it was like, well, we can't drive around a garden um, or a field or something like that. So um, we discovered there was a track up at uh, just outside Banbury and at Shennington and went up there and took this this contraption up there and suddenly discovered that there was this whole world of of car you could race these things and 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 what we'd actually bought was a complete piece of shit um but it, it ignited a passion and you know suddenly that's life my school career went out the window at that point it was all about going what racing was it that it gave you so it's like when you describe being immersed in that bambi racing track what was it that it sparked in you I don't know, it was just being at one with a machine and going as fast as you can, as fast as you dare, you know, and, and then suddenly you're racing against other, you know, uh, you know, kids as well and, and, you know, trying to catch, trying to overtake. Uh, it was just that, that adrenaline buzz of, of speed. And then, you know, my childhood was then obsessed with, um, you know, 
going racing and and polishing the go-kart in the garage and trying to understand I, you know i slept with an engine in my bedroom for about 12 months um which absolutely stank and i shared a bedroom with my my younger brother at the time and um so he wasn't very happy about it but um but yeah it just ignited a passion in me and and all i wanted to do at that point was you know be a driver so one of the questions that jake and i often ask our interviewees is the question of what goes from your childhood would we still see rattling around your adult body? So now that you're a team principal, yeah. hugely successful, what goes from that 12-year-old you that first got that go-kart is still being applied here now at Red Bull? Still that passion, still that buzz. You know, when the lights come on on a Sunday afternoon, I still get the same energy as when the flag dropped when I was 12. There wasn't lights in those days. Um, so it's still that... <laughs> It's still, you know, that, that adrenaline rush that you get from these high-performing cars. And, 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 of course, you know, the route that I went on, a big focus on being a driver, that, you know, detoured further down the, down the line. But I, I think you, you, you've got to have that, have that passion. And some people, you know, have it for, for different sports, different things. For me, it was about... It was the smell of the engines. It was the noise. It was the energy that they create. And that was like, wow, I want to, I want to be part of this. What about understanding then the work ethic that goes with that? Where did that come from? Because you can't just be passionate and not work hard. Equally, you can't just work hard without a passion because it's just hard work. So where did, where did you get the understanding from of actually what dedication was required to be successful? I think that ethic really came from my mum and dad because um, they didn't come from affluent backgrounds and and you know they both work you know really hard and the um you know the one thing that they instilled i've got two brothers a, a younger and an older brother and we're all very different characters but the one thing that they instilled in all of us was that you know if you want to achieve something you've got to work hard for it mm. and uh yeah my father was successful in what it, what he was doing with the business he had my mum was a a teacher and then she had other jobs because they, you know she wanted to achieve other things so part of it's i think you know nature and some of it's nurture um but certainly that ethic of if you want something you know you've got to go out and and and, and earn it and achieve it there was no sort of pocket money weekly it was like oh no you want to earn some money you go and go and earn some you know wash the cars and you can get a one pound fifty i think it was in in those okay. days but how did you then sort of reconcile for your parents the fact that this had started as a hobby and then it was something that you wanted to pursue as a career um i was fortunate that my parents were you know they were supportive of us following our dreams and they encouraged us always to think you know, think big, chase your dreams. Um, never just accept that we're just being one of a one of a number. And uh, you know, we're all three very different different characters. My older brother was the academic one, and he, he was got the best school grades, and went on to be a be a lawyer. My younger brother's a complete hooligan, um, and you know went a different path in 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 life, but again equally successful because he had that had that drive. And for me, you know, school rapidly became a a social thing um, because all I was thinking about was going racing. And of course, it was something I could share with my father, who had, you know, he had an amateur's passion for the for the sport. He was from the motor industry. Yeah, and, and it was something I could engage, you know, with him over. And as I pro you know, progressed through my teens and we we're racing in, around the UK and it would be a family thing because we'd all go off, right. um, you know, to Scotland or Northumbria or wherever the go-kart track was as a, you know, as a family. And my brothers decided they didn't want to race so some that they'd come and, come and support me or do some mechanicking or make the sandwiches or whatever it was. And... Um, you know, as I progressed through sort of 15, 16, we started racing in Europe and you know, it, was a, it was just a, a momentum that was building. And then suddenly there's this world of car racing, you know, and, and that was what I, what I wanted to do. And I, I made a deal with my mum and dad because I wanted to leave school at 16 and just go racing. And I said, no, 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 that's completely irresponsible. You've got to do your A-levels mm. and you have to get a place in university. Um, and I had absolutely no intention of going anywhere near university. <laughs> so uh, I think uh, on the form, I remember just sticking a 
pin in for where I wanted to go. And I can't, I can't, I think it was Apple Riswith or somewhere, you know, it was, um, and, uh, anyway, so I stayed on and I did my A-levels. I managed to scrape through with just about enough, um, grades to be able to go to the university if I, if I wanted to, but I was already racing, um, you know, in Formula Renault at that stage. And, and I, I got no intention of going anywhere near a university. One of the things that people that listen to this podcast talk to us often about is that they feel that something's not right for them, but they aren't brave enough to make the decision to get rid of that thing. So I'd like to talk to you about the, the moment or the period yep. where you realized that the dreams of becoming a Formula One world champion wasn't going to happen. How did you come to that realization and how difficult was that? In the end, it was relatively straightforward because what, what happened was you, you set off on a uh, you know, on this on this voyage, so I, moved, I won a scholarship from racing karts. I'd finished in the top three in the in the UK in karting. I then won some races in Formula Renault, which was the gateway into the sport at that time. Then Formula Three and things, you know. And you'd think of being the next Nigel Mansell, and that's where you know, my focus and dreams were at that stage. And but I'd already started to recognise that at Formula Three, the guys I was going up against you know they were they were just quite simply better than i was and it was i managed to to bring together a budget because formula or motor racing unlike other sports is very dependent on the budgets that you can put together because you have to go and effectively pay for the service to drive for a team and um uh i didn't have enough money to go to a to a top team so I made the decision that well why don't we buy the car and you know, at least we've got a car at the end of the year rather than a set of overalls and some pictures and, uh, you know, try and do it ourselves. Yeah. And, um, and so that's, that's, I, I taught my father, uh, into it. Um, well, yeah, they, that's quite entrepreneurial though, isn't it? I would, well, I'd had to raise a lot of the sponsorship on my, you know, on my own. He'd given me, you know, support with opening the doors and, uh, to some of his contacts. And I'd basically tapped up every, um, schoolmate's, dad or you know who had a local business to to uh to sponsor me in my in my motor racing career and the contacts that my father had and um and i you know i was fortunate in that respect but, it, but i had to go out there and find the, the the sponsorship and so having done that it was then a question of well rather than waste it with an average team i may as well set this thing up and uh then if it doesn't work at least i've got something to fall back on. And I, I suppose the defining moment for me was even before the season had started at the beginning of 1998 was when I drove out the pit lane in, in Portugal. And there used to be a really high speed turn um, that was sort of one downshift st straight into the corner. And, um, and there's barriers that are about three meters from the edge of the track. So if you're gonna have a crash there, it was gonna be a big one. And um, Juan Pablo Montoya came past me as I was coming out of the, of the pit lane into this corner. And I could just see the angle that this car was at, the commitment that he had. You know, the rim is trying to push its way through the tire. And, and he just kept this thing absolutely planted. And I just knew that. I thought, I can't do that. My foot and brain interesting uh you know <laughs> there's something yeah. between them that's saying don't do it um and i knew i knew did you try and do it or? in reality i just knew that right. shit, i i haven't got the ability to disconnect the the risk hmm. versus the uh, you know the, the reward that it had and yeah. so you know low speed corners fine you could be as quick as anybody the high speed stuff whoa and seeing his commitment there was a was an eye opener to me to think, okay, you're not capable of doing that. Maybe it's time to start thinking about something. Yeah, that else. fascinates me, Christian, because a lot of people would often be that far in a career like you were. Mm -hmm. You've you put your neck out on the line. So yeah. You've got the sponsors. You've you, uh, you back yourself by buying the car. Like that hidden cost of time and investment in it is a difficult one to then step away from and and maybe take a different angle. Well, I could have gone a different path. I could have gone and raced in America or Japan or pursued other other avenues. But I thought, do you know what? I've I've created this. I've created this team. I've driven for some good teams and driven for some not so good teams. And 
I'd like to develop this team how I would like to drive for it if I was, you know, from a driver's perspective. And so it gave me a, an insight, albeit at a lesser level than anywhere near what our drivers are currently um, exposed to. But some of the emotions, the pressures, the isolation, the sense of team that, you know, are so, so important. And, and for me, it was an invaluable education. So, you know, when I first started out, and, 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 cr and created this uh, little what would be now Formula 2 team, I was having to do everything. So I was booking hotels. I was doing the VAT returns. I was paying the wages on every, uh, you know, every Friday. I was um, do it, booking the fuel, paying for the spare parts, um, borrowing as much money from the bank, constantly speaking with them every week about being overdone on the overdraft. The credit card was maxed out for paying for tires. And it was a complete juggling at but it was you know I was washing the truck um getting the pizzas in the evening for the mechanics so it was a tremendous education yeah. for me um to you know to go through that just dealing with with people and dealing with the pressures of running a little business because at the end of the day I think there were there were uh, two mechanics a truck driver and an engineer and those four people depended on me to pay their mortgage. So and that was a responsibility even at the age of 26. I mean, that's an amazing grounding in sort of just leading a team and a culture. So what was the biggest lesson you learned in that period of your life that still applies today? That it's all about people. It's about working with people. It's about getting them to work together. It's about having the ability to engage with people at any level, whether it's from a sponsor to a truck driver and having that ability to be approachable. Um, and for me, you know, that, that is something that's always been very important that, you know, that nobody should feel that they, oh, I don't want to talk to him, he's unapproachable, or, you know, and so on. And, uh, and I think when you've walked a mile in some of their shoes as well and done some of the, bought the pizzas and washed the truck and washed wheels and, and so on, you've, you know, you've experienced some of what they're having to experience. And so you, you know what's, what's required. But ultimately, I think just the skill set, and, and that went back to school. I was never the most academic at school. Um, I wasn't the best sportsman either, and it would give you popularity. But I just was able to get on with the geeky, clever guys and also the ones that, you know, were a bit more on the spectrum as, as well. And... Uh, you know, I think that's just a life skill, to be honest with you. So in this world that you're in now, which is so engineering heavy, is emotional intelligence one of the biggest skills in your role? Absolutely. And common sense at the end of the day. I'm not an engineer. I've never, I, you know, I don't have any engineering degrees. I couldn't tell you how the cars are, are built, even less so how an engine is built. Uh, but it's about, it's a people business, as most businesses are. And it's about getting a group of people together, mm. empowering them, giving them the right direction, removing the obstacles to allow them, enable them to do their jobs and just focus on their job without being troubled by worrying about what somebody else is doing or, you know, what another department's doing. And I think that that's a skill that maybe you had right at the very beginning. Cause I remember when I worked in formula one and I hadn't, I didn't know much about the sport and I was, talking to someone about you I was like what, what do I need to know about Christian and th this person said that they spoke with a mechanic that was involved in the Formula 3000 days mm -hmm. and it was a really bad season the car was really struggling that you had some sponsors at an event you stood up and spoke to the sponsors about the race and what's going to happen that weekend and he mm -hmm. said that by the time they all left the room and you left the room he was the mechanic he knew you were going to be struggling mm -hmm. but even he was like well I think we can <laughs> it, win this it's weekend gonna be all right we're gonna be okay <laughs> So I'm just really interested to know what skills you've picked up on how you can bring people on the journey with you because it is something that is would be useful for so many people. Well, I think you know, 90% of people just want you know clarity and, and, and a clear communication. They don't want stuff sugarcoating. They just want to know you know what's the situation. They don't, not a lot of people like small talk, you know, and it's about just being clear. And I think that um, I've always you know, tried very hard with whoever, whatever, you know, walk of life or or position anybody's in is just to have 
that that clarity and the approachability and i think that for me that again is something that runs through this team in that there's no room for for egos here you know it's it, it's all about team it's all about working for each other and and not just for as an individual and and i think that that's made this team it's one of the strengths that it's had is it's it's that sense of team that sense of collectiveness that you know we're all judged every two weeks on a sunday afternoon and every department needs to be working in harmony to for the car to to achieve that fin finish fly mm. line in first position so when you came into a team then and you're preaching this message of harmony and teamship first have there ever been any examples where you've been able to reinforce it through a symbolic gesture or having to deal with a particular conflict that you could share with us um i think you have to lead by actions you you don't you don't demand respect you are you earn it and i think every situation is is different i remember you know we had mark weber and and sebastian vettel uh you know relatively early on in their relationship were starting to get pretty feisty with each other and you could see this tension was was building and building and then we had a you know a problem where the two of them crashed into each other and it and that just took it to a whole new level and i thought i need to deflate this i need to put things into perspective here at the end of the day you know we're not saving lives we're a, we're a sport that's an entertainment and so i took i got both drivers and i took them um with david Coulthard actually to great ormond street to meet some of the kids that were having a tough time and also importantly the parents and to spend a morning there with those kids and parents and some of the heartache and mm -hmm. you know that that was real life issues and it just demonstrated that okay we've got it pretty good you know and and actually to respect each other's not a, you know it, with the, the challenges that the, the these poor children and their parents and the anguish that they had what we do is is nothing so after that visit, did you then have a meeting with them to? I didn't need to, you right. know, at that point. You know, they they um, they obviously spent time in you know during that morning with the kids and the, and the parents and and it was self-explanatory what was what was going on. And I think after that, we then had a period where there was a you know a reasonable you know respect between between the two of them. It boiled over at some points, but when you got competitive animals that's what that's what happens but uh it was a it was a good reminder at that point in time i think of, of all the myriad of hats you have to wear when you're the ceo of a team like this you know constantly speaking to red bull about funding mm. constantly trying to keep the sponsors happy yeah. um you've admitted yourself you know you couldn't build an engine yet you've embarked on that and we'll talk about that shortly but you yeah. have to go and speak to those people and still empower yeah. them and empower the aerodynamicists and you have then a huge team of people to bring with you and then the constant travel and the media duties mm -hmm. and amongst all of that the two of the people i guess at the center of the team the two drivers you have to get the balance absolutely right between pushing them to their limits but making them realize that they are driving for a team how do you how do you get that element right i mean i wonder whether that is takes up more of your time than you'd want or not um, sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And I think that different drivers need different approaches. I mean, some drivers very straightforward and, uh, you know, you, you bolt them in and they, they deliver other need a bit of a arm around the shoulders. Some need a kick up the ass. You know, they're all, they're all very, very different. Um, and the word teammate is a complete fallacy because that's yeah. absolutely what they're not because the guy in the other car is basically dictating your um your value you know that's uh and f ultimately your your career so because that's the only person that you can be truly gauged against so um and i think with experience it helps having dr driven a bit helps um so that you can at least talk in a language and try to relate to some of the problems that they're experiencing. And you, you talked about it as, as kind of being lonely or being quite an isolated role in the team. Can you explain that? Um, well, no, nobody ever turns around and says, well done, yeah. you know, um, 
and I think that it can be a it can be a lonely position because um, you've got an awful lot of responsibility. Um, it consumes a huge percentage of your your life. You've got accountability, um, and it's a pressure, and you learn to deal with that pressure, or you you know succumb to it. And I think that it's being able to manage and compartmentalize what's important at what point in time. And do you ever feel overwhelmed by it? I wouldn't say overwhelmed. There's days where you think, you know, <laughs> there's quite a bit on. But no, I think, look, you know, it's... it's. Uh, I remember um, in the early days, um, I flew to a hearing with the FIA with Ron Dennis because we were both in trouble for having not taking the start of the US Grand Prix. And uh, he gave me a very useful bit of advice, which always stuck with me, which he said, look, you know, I've always said to any eat an elephant, you've got to do it, you know, piece by piece. You know, you're never going to do it in one sitting. You've got to, you've got to just break it down and, and go one step at a time. And that was, that always stuck with me, not because of the thought of Ron eating an elephant, but, um, <laughs> uh, you know, it was... It was pertinent because, you know, I think with experience as well, you learn to worry about the things that you can control and not the things that you can't. You have to let, because you can't control everything. Um, so focus on the things that you can rather than concern yourselves with the things that you can't. So how different is your management now to when you first walked through the doors here in your early 30s? Because I guess... There would have been doubters. There yeah. would have been people in the team that were disillusioned with recent results. You came yeah. in with this great promise of turning things around. What did you say? Well, I was 31 years of age when I walked through the front door and, um, you know, I was a kid. Um, did you think you were a kid? Um, no, at that time, of course I didn't. Um, I'd had success in, you know, I'd won a championship for three years in a row in, in what is the understudy of Formula 1 now, Formula 2, Formula 3000, as it was known in those days. So I'd had an element, you know, of success and I walked in and it was just a, just a much, much bigger environment than what I come from. So I thought, I'm just going to stick to all the same basics that served me well to win those championships in, in Formula 2 and apply them in Formula 1. And that is about you, know, you surround yourself with the right people, empower those people, be clear in the objectives and what the expectations are and try to remove the obstacles so that they can they can do their job. And, you know, when I first turned up here, I think there was complete dismay that they put a, some kid you know, in charge. But there was a couple of guys, one that's still on the front end of um, Max's car that that had also graduated from Formula 2 or Formula 3000 that, that knew me. Mm -hmm. And... Um, <clears throat> and, you know, they uh, they were tremendously supportive uh, at that time. DC, who was our driver, I knew from those years back, go-kart racing, and he was a familiar face, and he was someone that I could bounce ideas off because he'd driven for Williams, he'd driven for McLaren, and he'd come to, to Red Bull. So he was somebody that I said, well, I don't understand what on earth these guys are talking about, that yeah. even the language they're using. I don't and he said, well, neither do I. And I've just come from McLaren. So I think, okay, we need to break things. And do you remember down. what you said to kind of set the tone straight away under your tenure here? Um, I just... I, I, Did you address yeah, everyone at once? Time. Yeah, I, everyone yeah the, whole, the whole factory was pulled together. Um, and it was announced to them that the previous management, because they'd... Red Bull had only bought Jaguar at the end of 2004, and this was beginning of January 2005. They were all bought together. And basically, the current team principal had been fired that morning. Um, the company had been bought together, and da da, this is, uh, you know, Christian Horner, he's now going to be the, the, the new team principal. And there was a sort of a look of shock as I looked out at this sea of faces and thinking, who's this kid that they've ever met? So I went back to, you know, what was my office? I had a secretary in tears because her previous boss had just been fired. Um, I got his Christmas cards on the desk, his coffee cup half drunk. And it was like, okay, <laughs> so this is the start. Wow. This is the start. And a pretty disgruntled workforce that all went home at five o'clock. 
uh, <laughs> I think, in protest. So it was then a question, right, okay, I've got to learn about this team, the people, understand its strengths and weaknesses. And, and, and that was really what I set about the next six months doing was just looking, listening, talking to people, getting to know and understand the business. But when you went back into that office and you closed the door and it was just yourself, how did you sort of manage your self-talk to stop the doubts that other people might have had consuming you? I never had those doubts. It was like, okay, this is the starting point, get on with it, you know? Right. And it was a question of, I've got to roll my sleeves up. I've got to, I've got to get stuck in. I've got nothing to lose. Um, and I'm just going to do, stick with my values and my, trust my own instinct, trust my own limited experience that I had at that point in time. But that was, you know, to try and understand the strengths and weaknesses, try and understand the dynamics, you know, of the place and just get to know the people. Because the dynamics, are, as I understand it, Christian, for you coming in here is different from, say, some of the others where the owners uh, um, of, like uh, you mentioned, Ron Dennis or some of those other examples, whereas this is managed, like you had to manage upwards as well. Yeah. So what was it that you think they saw in you that gave them that confidence that you were going to turn this around? Well, I think Helmut Marco, I raced against his team in, in Formula 2. Um, I, he, he then um, sold his team and he became in charge of the young driver programs for, for, for Red Bull. And they had a really exciting young talent called Vitantonio Liuzzi. And I was desperate to have him as a, as, as a driver in the, in the Arden team. And so typical helmet, I, I did a really aggressive deal. Um, well, he did a really aggressive deal with me where basically the minimum fee that he would pay was about 50%. So I said, okay, I'll do it for that. But for every Grand Prix we win, I want, you know, there to be a 50,000 bonus, um, which he agreed to. And we won nine out of the 10 races that year. So I think without that, I'd have gone bankrupt. But, um, uh, and he liked that, that spirit and the fact that I got that confidence. I knew him from before that because when I first started this team, um, I needed a, to buy a trailer. And um, it turned out that this Austrian fellow was selling a trailer. So I went to Graz, saw this trailer, met Helmut. I hadn't got a clue who he was. He seemed like a pretty straightforward kind of guy. Um, agreed a price. Um, and he said he'd deliver it in a week's time, but it had to be money up front. So fair enough. So I went home and I, I'd borrowed the money from the bank and finance and this and that and the other. I remember my father was away at the time. And, uh, and I sent basically all the money that I could conjure up to pay for this, for this trailer. My father came back from this trip where he'd been and he said, I said, oh, I bought a trailer. And he said, well, great, where is it? I said, oh, it's in Austria. <laughs> said, okay, well, um, when, you know, how much and when, when are you going to pay for it? I said, oh, I've paid for it. He said, what, you've, you've bought a trailer off a bloke in Austria you've just met and how, how much of the money did he I said, I sent all of it because he would only deliver it if I sent. Uh, and he said, are you stupid? Um, and I'd suddenly I then thought, oh my God, you know, he seemed like a straight guy, blah, blah, blah. And, and the trailer, sure enough, of course, it, it, it arrived. But that was my first interaction with Helmut and then obviously racing against him, then getting drivers. And he saw, um, I think, some qualities in me. He then recommended me to, to Dietrich. And Dietrich has always been tremendously good at giving youth an opportunity. You've seen it with the junior program, with across the football um, academies and all, all the sports and so on that they're in. And he was prepared to take a risk. And uh, yeah, I was 31 years of age and, and, and basically they gave me the keys and said, get on with it. Even that story though, sums up the things that we've discussed, which is that even when it comes to buying a trailer, you kind of go for it and then think about it afterwards and yep. see there might've been a few issues. But at the time you have just total self-belief that, that this yep. thing will be okay. We have a lot of people telling us that the problem is they don't get to that point because the fear is too great. Have you never had an issue where, <clears throat> or a mindset where the fear dominates? You seem to you seem to have, it's not an arrogance, it's just a self-confidence that things will be okay. You're, you're an optimist. Yeah. No, absolutely. I'm definitely glass half full 
rather than half empty kind of person. I think oh, you've got to push yourself. You've got to, you, you won't get anywhere in life through being conservative. And I've always pushed myself to the, to the limit. Um, and as a result of that, you push the people, uh, you, you know, around you, mm -hmm. take them on that, on that journey. And uh, I suppose I've applied that philosophy, you know, in everything yeah. that, I've, that I've done. I've pushed myself, pushed the, the team, you push the boundaries. So how do you hire people where you know, once you've offered them the job, they're gonna be the kind of people that buy into that philosophy? What's your, what's your secret to recruitment? Well, I think that, you know, first of all, they've got to buy into a culture and they have to, that comes ultimately that emanates down from the very top so ultimately from red bull into into us and then of course how we run the business you know here so for example adrian was a was a classic one so i set my sights on adrian um by spring 2005 as right you know i've been a massive fan of his cars growing up this was this iconic design and nobody believed we would get him yeah. or convince him to come here. But, um, and that's where DC was helpful because I said, you've driven for Adrian, what do we need to do? Yeah. Um, and DC said, well, it's all about Adrian and his wife at the time. So, um, and I said, well, let's take him out for dinner. You look after the wife and I'll have a chat with, <laughs> uh, have a chat with Adrian. Right. Um, but, well, DC was always very skilled in, <laughs> in that department. Um, and, uh, you, you know, it turned out that we'd grown up uh, in the same part of the UK yeah. and uh, had similarities um, in, in outlook. And I think it, th there was a, a vibe that he mm. got from me. I then took him to Austria to see the world of Red Bull and so on and, and was able to convince him that, look, yeah, there's risk, yeah, but the reward will be fantastic. See, I think yeah. you can't convince people to do something unless you believe it, right? Yeah, yeah. So it's so important that you believe when you have that conversation with Adrian, well, of course we're going to hire him and, and yeah. of course he's going to be successful. Yeah. And once Adrian came, then that's the biggest yeah. advert to everybody else to say, wow, these people are serious. And to be honest with you, I'm doing exactly the same thing with the powertrain business now is um, getting the best talent, going for the best people and saying, look, yeah, there's a risk. You know, Red Bull, as was famously said by a current seven-time world champion, they're a fizzy drinks company. How can they make a racing car? You know, and the same would apply to an engine. But, you know, we'll do it and we'll do it. We'll do it well and we'll get the best people involved and we'll give them a great environment and it'll be inclusive. And, and you know, that breeds um, and, and perpetuates throughout a business and I think it, all the talent that we've brought into the team over the years and the reason we've had tremendous stability as well is because you know it it, it just uh it perpetuates throughout throughout the business so can I ask you then about motivation of yep. these high performing and ambitious people that you're recruiting so I can imagine in the four title winning years motivation comes easy success yep. breeds success how do you maintain it when you're not winning titles? Well, that's the, that's the tough bit. That's actually probably been the toughest part, I would say, of the last 17 years. Because, you know, we first five years were all about building and then we started winning and we won everything for four years, even though two of those years went down to the, to the wire. And then 2014 comes along. There's a big change in regulations. The engines changed, you know, significantly in configuration. And um, suddenly we're second best, but we're not just second best, we're second best by miles. Mm. And everybody's been used to winning. Everybody's been used to going to races and you know, if we're not winning, we're competing for the win and suddenly we're, we're nowhere and you could feel the energy dipping. And of course then people become a little bit disgruntled and you become easy to be picked off by some of your your competitors. So that period was all about retaining, you know, the belief that, you know, we'll get this sorted out. How did you do that? It was about, again, just talking with people, getting them together, talking it through, saying, right, what do we need to do to get this, this sorted? There are no short-term fixes. And step by step, you know, we've built, a bit, and it's taken a while, it's taken five years to get ourselves back into a championship contending position but 
when I look around the senior people, there's 75% of those are the ones that were there in 2013. And how did you manage your own doubts or concerns during that period then? As an eternal optimist. Yeah, I think that, that the fear of failure pushes you pushes you on and you know having achieved that success you just want to you want to it becomes almost like a drug that you know we've got to get back to that we've got to get back to that situation of winning um and it becomes addictive in in many respects and um i think that it's that you know if if it doesn't hurt when you lose then you're not in the right position or in the right role or the right job and I think it it really hurts if we don't if we don't win a race and I think you want to get back to that feeling of but the nature of an addiction sometimes leads people to take shortcuts to get that mm -hmm. that hit that adrenaline rush and yet you're describing that you're almost having to preach patience that this is a process yeah. that you're building towards so how do you manage that dichotomy? Well, there's always there's always a path to getting back, and you've just got to look at that path and say, okay, what do we need to achieve along that journey? And we had a very clear area that was our Achilles heel, which was you know, our engine wasn't as powerful as our competitors. So, okay, how can we push our engine supplier? So we, we tried every possible tactic to push, motivate, um, uh, you know, that them into a more competitive position. And we were able to win races and we could grab opportunities, um, but we couldn't put a sustained uh, campaign together. So then it came about, okay, we need to take a risk. We've got to get out of this rut. We've got to do something. Just doing the same thing is, we're just repeating the same mistake. So let's do something different. Let's go with Honda. You know, Honda had been a disaster with McLaren. McLaren had ditched Honda, they'd walked away from them. Honda were on the verge of leading the sport, but we saw the same passion and desire in them. And on top of that resource, I thought, okay, let's give this a go. Let's see if we can make it work. And I think out of, what have we done? 40 something races, we've been on the podium in over half of those Grand Prix mm. so far and won six Grand Prix and currently fighting you know, for a world championship. Can you share with us how you tried to motivate Renault when things weren't going well and how you also managed that message to the rest, the rest of the team here? Because we have lots of business leaders that listen to this and they can control their own environment as much as they like, mm. which you can do here, but you can't control the environment at an external supplier. And, you know, in the car, it's such a big part of the car. Yeah, that was very difficult because, you know, we were a customer. Yeah. Um, and again, I must have gone to Paris three or four times to sit down with Carlos Ghosn, the, the chairman mm. of the time, to say, look, if you're in this business and want to, you're spending a hell of a money, but you might need to spend just a little bit more and a little bit more wisely. Otherwise, you're wasting what you're, mm. you know, you're currently spending. You're not getting return from that. But his heart was never in Formula 1. It was just a marketing thing that ticked tick the box that passion and drive and you were never going if he didn't have it how could you expect that to flow through his his organization their current ceo is full of passion yeah and that will drive ultimately you know performance and results because it emanates from the from from the very top and did you find that that period dulled your motivation or did it do the opposite no, I think it enhances it in some respects because you're using, okay, we've got to get back into a winning position. And then we had an agreement with Mercedes and then that got uh, reneged on. We had, um, you know, you try, you try and get yourself back into a competitive position. Um, and, and, and then Honda, again, there was large amount of risks associated with it, but the reward looked, the upside looked fantastic if we could make it work and you know we're we're in that process and and then they've announced they're going to stop and suddenly we've experienced this new world of working with a partner and being integrated rather than just as a customer supplier relationship how can we go back to being a customer supplier so then we there's this huge dilemma what do we do going forward and that's why the decision was taken okay 
let's take control of our own destiny. And, and, and I have to say hats off to, to Dietrich Malaschitz and Red Bull for, for, for going for it because, you know, there's no guarantees. It's not the cheapest of routes either, but it's one to say, okay, let's make it work. So within reason, obviously, are you the kind of person that believes that anything is possible? Yeah, absolutely. Otherwise I wouldn't be sitting here. You know, it's, a sim it's as simple as that. If you put your mind to it, you can achieve anything. And who do you turn to then to help you formulate those beliefs? Because like the example you used about Montoya taking that bend and you, and you realizing that's outside of my range of skills, mm -hmm. who sort of is your sounding board now to sometimes rein you back in to be your equivalent of Montoya to say, Christian, I think that's not quite um, I think you need honest people around you. So, you know, your core team, they can be, they can be honest with you. Of course, you know, my wife, um, you know, she can be brutal. Uh, Is it helpful though to get advice from people outside the world? Or yeah, definitely, sometimes? definitely. And I think that, that um, <laughs> advice is perhaps sometimes not too much stronger. I've, I've learned a, a lot from watching Dietrich, how he runs the business. What big lessons have you taken um, from him? Just the way he empowers people, um, the enthusiasm that he, uh, you know, infects within a business. So I think he's been a, a tremendous, um, uh, you know, he, he's been a tremendous example of how to get the best out of people, how to create a culture. Um, and then it's always interesting to look at other sports, how people... Uh, you know, operate. I'm, I'm not on big table banger. You know, I'd rather sit down and have a discussion that was logical and thought out than shouting and screaming because I'd, I'd never feel that really achieves anything. Um, but it's always fascinating to look at other industries, other sports, how, you, you know, how, how people deal with that, you know, their, their, their own issues. And what's the most brutal... And you said, like, your wife's good at giving you brutal feedback. What... What's the best piece of feedback you've had that you've taken on board and you've seen the best result from it? She she's she's got a saying, she's got a few sayings, but she's um she's always got a saying, she'd always be aware that, you know, a pat on the back is six inches from a kick out the arse. Um and that's absolutely true, you know, particularly within, you know, a media world that we that we live in. People love to build you up and they love even more to knock you down. And I think the biggest lesson with that is just ignore it. Just do your own thing. And people will judge you for, you know, you can't control what people think of you. People will have an opinion. They either like you or they don't. That's, that's their prerogative. And I think that um, just learning to let go of that, learning to let go of wanting to be liked, I think is a very empowering when, thing. And when did you learn to let go of it? I think, I, I, I think after we, st you know, Probably um, we'd had the success and then suddenly you have that downward spiral. Yeah. And probably at that point, because obviously then there's, you know, are the team up to it? Is Christian up to it? Blah, blah, blah. You just got to let it go. You got to believe in yourself and do the best you can. And you'll be judged on that at the end of the day. Can I talk to you about, um, the, you've mentioned quite a few times empowering the people that work at Red Bull. Yeah. Sounds great. How do you do it? I've always believed in employing people to do the job and letting them do the job rather than telling them then how to do the job. Otherwise, you may as well do it yourself. Mm -hmm. So, so um, I, again, I think you have to build an environment around them that enables them to focus on what they're, what they're good at. I mean, it's like Adrian. Adrian is an artist. There's no point Adrian managing a bunch of people because it'd be chaos. And, it, you know, he, he would be the first to accept that but you want to give him the freedom uh, the freedom as an artist to be creative and I think that's why he's been here probably at least twice as long as any other yeah. team you know in the sport and I think it's it's having that feeling you know feeling of empowerment and allowing them to do their job without micromanagement yeah everybody's accountable everybody's answerable at some point in time but it's a question of look you're here to do be an aerodynamicist or a mechanical designer or a mechanic or a whatever 
function it is. Um, you know what's expected. Over, over to you. So how would you describe the culture then that you want to create? What would be your ideal culture? Well, culture, you know, very much is one that is, one that is totally apolitical. That is not. There's no finger pointing. Um, and it's about very much team. Everything we do is very much about, you know, the team and it's inclusive. It's not being afraid to make mistakes. You know, people make mistakes. We're human beings. We all make mistakes. The most important thing is to learn from those mistakes and apply those learnings and findings to try and avoid them, yep. you know, in, in the future. Um, you don't want just a bunch of sheep. You want people to have a voice to be able to speak their mind to get across you know their concerns um, or their contribution and I think it's that kind of environment communication is so so important I was going to ask because how do you nurture that because there's lots of people that listen to this that understand around psychological safety being able to make a mistake and not have it held against them forever as long as they learn from it and to feel empowered to speak up how do you as the leader of that culture, create that environment for those things to, to blossom in? I think it's one of inclusiveness. And I think that what's been interesting over the last 12 months is we've all had to exist in a Zoom environment or FaceTime or what, you know, uh, and you lose that empathy of, you know, meetings go on forever. People have got other stuff going on whilst the meeting's going on. And yes, the technology enables you to continue to function, but you lose that that interaction and that's why I think it's so vital that you're able to look somebody in the face you're able to have that personal interaction yeah. and it's it's those things that make make the difference mm. to be able to have a couple of engineers have a coffee together and talk about the performance of the car and that you're not constantly forcing it yeah you know, it's happening naturally and what are you like with being vulnerable and admitting you made a mistake um, uh, you know, I think you have to be not be afraid to stick your hand up and say, yeah, okay, we yeah. got that wrong. You know, I got it wrong. I'm not perfect. I'm far from perfect, but I try to get things, more things right than I get wrong. And if I get something wrong, don't be afraid to learn from it, you know, to say, okay, we fucked up. You know, I got, I got it wrong. We need to, but not be afraid to change direction and say, okay, well, okay, we're going to go this way now. So a race weekend on a Sunday and there's a mistake that costs a, a win or a podium or a points finish. How quickly have you moved on from that at the start of the next week? Um, usually within 24 hours, right. 36 hours. You've lost that fear. It still hurts. Uh, but you, you sleep the second night. Um, so, uh, and it's a matter of understanding, okay, what could we have done better? You know, what could we have done better? I mean, we just lost a race to Lewis. Uh, all the media think it's down to the strategy. The reality was they were just quicker than us. There's no point beating yourself up about the strategy. The reality is we just need a faster car. Mm. And then you get the strategic options. So again, it's focusing on the things that are the reality rather than the fiction. Correct. And as somebody that's been in your position for now a long period of time, like... There's something exceptional about it. Exceptional leaders, you think of someone from a different sport like Alex Ferguson that mm -hmm. did it for a long time. And they talk about that reinvention of themselves. Yep. What would you say has been the biggest reinvention that you've been through so far in your, in your time as? I think it's a consistent evolution rather than a reinvention. So I'm probably very different now to the day that I walked in, in in many respects, but I think fundamentally I'm still the same person underneath. Yep. You know, I've got the same characteristics, um, the same principles. I just think you learn to apply them differently. And again, I think you learn to understand what's important at the end of the day and what is just noise. So what would you say if somebody was observing you from that first day you came in at 31 years of age to observing you today, what would they see as being the biggest difference? I think they think you'd aged a lot. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, what would they see as the biggest difference? You'd have to ask them that, really. I mean, I think it's, 
it's all it's all about evolution isn't it and and you're constantly learning in life in in business through being a parent um just the journey that life gives you you're always learning you're always evolving and and you shouldn't be afraid to you know you got to embrace change not be afraid of change you know at the end of the day so what lesson would you have taken from the journey you've been on that you pass on to your children now then I think to not be afraid of chasing your dreams, to not be afraid of of shooting for the stars because you might land on the moon. You know, it's you get one life and you've got to go for it. We're here for such a small percentage of time that, you know, don't waste it. Mm. Go for it. You know, you whatever it is, whatever gives you a passion in life, chase it and don't wait because... It might not, you might not never get ever get the chance again. So you know, you've got to grab it, embrace it, and pick it up and run and 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 enjoy it. That's the other thing. I enjoy what I do. I'm just fortunate I get paid for something that I enjoy doing. And I think if you're doing something just for the money, that's not right. That's that's you, you're never going to get the best out of something if it's just about the paycheck at the end of the month. You've got to love what you do you've got to enjoy what you do and then if you do that you're going to do it a lot better brilliant we've reached our quick fire round at the very end of the interview um three non-negotiable behaviors that you and the people that come into red bull and work around you have to buy into i'd say integrity Mm -hmm. honesty um and competitiveness probably three fundamentals and what advice would you give to a teenage Christian just starting out? Uh, um, I, what advice would I say? I would probably say, yeah, don't pay the full amount of money up front for the trailer. <laughs> <laughs> Put down a deposit and wait for delivery. <laughs> um, thank God it worked out all right. Uh, one book recommendation that you have really learned a lot from that you could recommend to our audience? Oh, um, I don't know. I always like, you know, I find biographies quite interesting. And so, again, learn, just learning how people operate, whether it's an Alex Ferguson. I've always been a, he's a very different character I am, but I've always admired, you know, what he achieved and how he achieved it. And finally, Christian, what's your one golden rule to live a high performance life? Ah, uh, the one golden rule to live a high performance life. It's just got to be take each day as it comes. You know, don't think too far ahead and, and just, you know, take, take whatever life throws at you each one day at a time. Listen, thank you so much. It's, it's so interesting for me to sit and go through, you know, the, the way that you've built this team. Because I remember coming into Formula One and seeing all these identical Formula One teams that would just turn up, have a table for their sponsors, race and go home again. And then there was suddenly this other team who were jumping off barges and having parties and inviting hundreds of people back to the house of the team principal for a party on the night before or the night after the British Grand Prix. And I remember looking at it thinking, how can you have that much fun? and be that successful because this was in the era yeah, where yeah. you were winning you know four titles on the bounce so it's such a pleasure to kind of put a bit of meat on the bones and i guess from afar we all make up what we think is happening somewhere and then it's nice to finally get some answers to that because um for me it was a great lesson that you can actually be successful and enjoy life at the same time i think for too long i always thought you could either have one or the other no i think uh, as i say life is so short you've got to enjoy it and you got to enjoy the ups. You got to learn from the downs, and and that you know, the bad days make the good days even better. Thanks, mate. Love that. Thank you. Great to see you. Thank you. Thank you for your time. Please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure. <laughs>